Well, well, welcome. We are, we're in a, uh, a, a sermon series going through the book of Acts together, and we are in Acts chapter 5. So if you get your Bible out, turn on your phone, get to the Version app, whatever you're using, turn with me to Acts chapter 5. Let me just recap where we've been over the past six weeks. Jesus ascends to heaven. The 120 gather in the upper room. The Holy Spirit is poured out. They speak in other languages. Peter preaches and 3,000 people get saved. They heal a lame beggar. Peter preaches and 5,000 people get saved. They get put in prison for preaching the name of Jesus. They are threatened to just stop using that name because there's something about that name. And the church is continuing to grow. Um... All kinds of amazing things are happening. Let me give you, just right before we get to chapter 5, I want to read the end of chapter 4, verse 32. This gives you kind of an understanding of what's going on at this point. Verse 32, it says, All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, maybe you've never gone to this extent, right? You never sold a house, sold some land, brought it to church and said, here, I I just use it however you see fit to help meet the needs. But this is kind of, this is kind of what happens when the Holy Spirit starts to work in people. And you're like, well, I don't know if I'd ever necessarily see myself doing that. But here's what happens, is that when the Holy Spirit begins to work in you, it starts to loosen your grip on your stuff and tighten your grip on people. You may never have some land to sell. You may never have a, have a house that you're going to sell and you're just going to want to donate it and all that kind of God may never call you to do that. But what really happens on the inside of us, all of a sudden you start loosening your grip on your stuff and you start tightening your, your grip on, on people. Why would I say that this is the work of the Holy Spirit? Because it's the work of Jesus. This is what Jesus teaches. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, thir- verse 31, I'm going to read it to you in the message paraphrase because I just like the way it's worded. Matthew 6, 31 in the message paraphrase, Jesus says, what I'm trying to do here is to get you all to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. The Holy Spirit will loosen your grip on your stuff and tighten your grip on others. We know this like when we have kids, you see toddlers, their their first words, apart from dada, for my kids, were uh, no and mine, right? No, mine, no, mine. I mean, it was just pretty much what my kids said for the first year. Uh, No, mine. Uh, Because why? Because they're um, utterly just preoccupied with what they can possess. What what is what is mine? Um, I am I am preoccupied with with getting, but the heart of God is always preoccupied with people, not possessions. And and what we hope as we grow in the Lord is that we just don't grow old. We actually grow up right? That we grow not into the no mine and be 72 and saying no mine, no mine, but that we realize that God's called us to, to share, you know, like our parents taught us when we were, when we were kids. Amen. Hmm. That's interesting. So here's the point. If you find yourself white knuckling your stuff, having a hard time sharing, you may need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I'm trying. Um, Then before we get to to chapter 5, Luke gives us an example of this uncommon generosity. And listen closely to what I'm about to read because it is going to set us up for what we're about to read in chapter 5. These things are connected. They're not just, I know there's chapters and verses, but these aren't disconnected. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, that's kind of what he's known as, Barnabas, right? Which means son of encouragement. He sold a field he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. 
That's just kind of an example of one of the many things that people were doing in the early church. So now we get to Acts chapter 5. Um, would, why, don't, why don't we stand as we honor the reading of God's Word? Uh, you know, this, this scripture, Acts chapter 5, is one of, if not the most difficult passages in the book of Acts. It is jarring. It is uh, scary. It seems out of place. It's a bit confusing. So let's dig in. It's going to be awesome. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the, the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Uh, yeah. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, doo -doo -doo, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yeah, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church, in all who heard about these events. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, uh, the beauty of going through your word is that we're confronted with, well, not too many people preach on Ananias and Sapphira. And so, Lord, I, I firmly believe that you've got something for us in the midst of it. I pray that your word would uh, draw fruit out of your people and that we wouldn't leave this place the same. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The title of my message today is, wait, what? That's literally the title of my message. Wait, what? Because it's kind of like everything's going all great. I mean, it's like they always say, it's all fun and games until you have two dead bodies on your hands, right? I mean, that's, am I right or am I right? The crazy thing is, is that you can read it. It looks like the job of um, doing the dirty work was given to the youth group. And uh, I, being a youth pastor, I, I feel for that youth pastor in the early days, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many times they're like, hey, we've got a great job for the youth to do. Why don't you come over here? If you could just clean this up, that'd be great, right? I'm telling you, like, there have been so many times where the youth were given the job of cleaning the basement and doing all kinds of things, the dirty work that nobody else wants to do. Uh, this, is a, this is a jarring story, and it seems like, what, what in the world is this all about? And the biggest question that people ask, and maybe you, you even ask, and I ask, is why did God kill them? But honestly, like the biggest question that we should be asking is, how am I still alive? <laughs> how am I not dead? I mean, this, this cup, I've done a lot worse. I'm just going to be honest with you. Like, how are they, how, how am I still alive? And, and out of this story, we, we, you know, we look at it and we're like, Luke is this is essentially like a thumbnail sketch of the first 30 years of the early church? Why in the world, out of all the things that Luke could have left out, this, this might have been one. 
You just be like, this is a little messy and weird. We don't really know what to do with it, so we're just going to just gloss over that and move on to the next awesome thing that, that God does. But I firmly believe that if it's in the Bible, then it's in the Bible for a reason, and that the heart of God is trying to communicate something to his people. So there's something in here that we're supposed to get and understand and not just freak out and gloss over and never preach on. The Ananias and Sapphira in this story, there's something in the heart of God that he's wanting to communicate. So first of all, let's be clear about what it's not communicating. It is not saying that Christians should sell everything, give everything away, and if you don't, you might just die. It's not what it's saying. In fact, Peter clarifies it in verse 4. He says this, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not just lied to human beings, but to God. In other words, this, this uncommon generosity that we see in, in this scripture is not a requirement, it's voluntary. So, so if maybe you've heard this or read Ananias and Sapphira in the story before, or maybe heard somebody preach on it, this is not promoting Christian communism. Okay? We've tried that and done that. It always goes weird, right? This is not saying that this is the way things are supposed to be. Ananias and Sapphira could have invested the money. They could have given it to their children. They could have gone on a vacation to Tahiti, whatever they want to do. The money belonged to them. They could have done whatever they wanted to do with it, right? So, so what we're seeing here and happening here in the early church is descriptive, not prescriptive. We talked about that a few weeks ago in another portion of the book of Acts that we were, that we were going through. And, and what that means is that it describes what happened. It doesn't prescribe what has to happen. It just says this is what was going on. And from time to time, people would sell land and give it to the apostles to, to, to give to people that were in need. So we can take a deep breath in that. And just like, okay, good. Essentially, the Holy Spirit of God was simply leading people to do what they could to, in order to help the brothers and sisters that were in need in the early church. And there were, there were many. And so people were doing things like this. And here's the cool thing. The heart behind this generosity is not uncommon today, especially at New Life Church. Now, maybe you're like, I haven't sold land and given it all. Like I, what I find here is this. As a pastor, is that when there is a need in the church, the Holy Spirit always puts it on someone's heart to meet that need. And if you refuse to, he'll find somebody else. Do you realize that? That like it's all his and he's just like, hey, I'd love for you to be a part of this blessing. And if we're like, mm, kind of stingy, I'm not going to. He's like, okay, I'll find somebody else. Literally, whenever there is a need, whether that need is to provide for a drug rehab in Russia or pave a parking lot, like God's people rise up and, put, and God puts it on people's hearts to, to meet that need. Because when the Holy Spirit is leading you, church, you will view giving as a blessing, not a burden. All of a sudden, God just works in you, and you're like, man, I, I, I got a case of I can't help myself. I'm going to give. Why? Because it's a blessing, not a burden. And so Ananias could have said, hey, you know, look, look, we sold this land, and we're going to give 50% of it to the church. And that would have been awesome. That would have been great. It would have been completely generous, amen, right? But they didn't. It's not what they did. Instead, they, they lied about it. And so what I want you to understand here is, in this whole story is that their fatal sin was not greed. It wasn't that they, they held back part of the money for themselves and they should have given it all because, but their greedy little hands wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Their fatal sin was pride. It was essentially Ananias and Sapphira thought, well, we want to look like Barnabas too. Remember Acts chapter 4 verse 35 and 36 of the story of Barnabas who sold all his land and then gave it all. Coincidence or not that like right before they give, there's this story of like a, good job Barnabas, you did this. And there's something on the inside of us too that like, well, I want to look like Barnabas. I, I, I want people to, to see me. Essentially, it is so easy for us to crave human praise rather than praise from God. And this is what was going on. It's so easy for you and I, especially here in America, to fall prey to this. This, this idea that, man, I would just love for people to praise me and we forfeit praise from God because we're, we're craving praise 
from man. It's so easy to get addicted to the praise of people. You can just take out your phone and scroll down through Instagram, Facebook, your, your social media of choice, and, and you will find a lineup of perfectly curated, filtered highlight reels of all your closest friends, right? Literally, just keep going through. And, and, and as we pinch and zoom their perfect life, we think, I want to have a perfect life like that. I want to look like that. I want to get as many likes and hearts as Barnabas. I want to, I want to look like that. And if we're not careful, we start to simulate holiness. What do I mean by that? Hmm. I mean that we, we start to do things because we want to please people rather than please God. And what ends up happening is what we call religion, where you forfeit the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life in order to do good things that you see other people doing. It's the epitome of what I always say, don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do, right? It's the epitome of religion, where you kind of are like, well, this seems to be what I'm supposed to do to be a part of this Christian club, and so I'm going to do this and not do this. Why? Because I want to be accepted by people, rather than allowing the Holy Spirit of God, the very Spirit of our Lord, to literally lead you, guide you, prick your heart, and start to lead you into areas and cause you to want to give or forgive or whatever that he calls you to do, you forfeit that for religion to to please people. And so we simulate holiness. And Ananias and Sapphira essentially said one thing with their mouth, but they held something very different in their hearts. Today we call it hypocrisy. And God obviously takes it very seriously. And I was like processing through it this week, like, why, why is this why does he take this so seriously? Why the instant, like, man, seriously, like, this seems like it's a little bit much. And I think it's because at the end of the day, we are creating an idol out of looking the part rather than listening to him. What? Not following the leading of the Holy Spirit, but just trying to appease the religious structure that we live in and look like other people so that we can get the applause of men rather than the applause of heaven. And so we forfeit what this whole thing was birthed in, that we follow the leading of God. <laughs> and essentially, if we look at Ananias and Sapphira, what they were doing was putting their reputation above their integrity. Let me say that again. They put their reputation above their integrity. And let me tell you, you can prop up your reputation for so long before your character cannot sustain it. Well, I want to look the part. I mean, man, look at this. Look what they did. Look what she did. Look what they are. Look at this family. Look at them. Look at their curated, filtered highlight reel of their entire life. Don't you want to be like, and you can literally simulate holiness to the point where you prop up your reputation to a point, and we see this, where your character can't sustain it because you put your reputation above your integrity. This is what we see in Ananias and Sapphira. It's a thing that they fell into, believing the lie that the applause of man is, is more satisfying than the applause of heaven. This is the lie that they fell into. And here's the thing. Make no mistake who's behind the lie. Make no mistake. I'll read it for you. Verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that who? That Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you've received for the land. So who's behind this? Satan. He literally says, Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when you start to believe a lie, you start telling lies because he's the father of lies. So when you start to hook, line, and sinker, receive the lie of the father of lies, you start telling lies in order to satiate yourself. Uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, he says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Catch that? The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. 
It's interesting. He said, why has Satan so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit? When Satan has filled your heart with lies, you start speaking lies. And as I, read, I was reading through this this week, and I, 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 you don't see a lot of sermons on this, so it was slim pickings. And uh, I was going through it, and I'm like, it's so weird how this reminds me of Adam and Eve. A- A- Ananias and Sapphira and, and Adam and Eve. And I was writing down something. I was like, both couples allowed Satan to fill their hearts with a lie, didn't they? Both couples believed that they couldn't fully trust God wholeheartedly. Both couples thought that God might be holding out on them, and so I better hold something back for myself. Both couples lied to God in order to cover up their hearts. What was really going on? And both couples experienced immediate consequence to their sin. It's interesting. We're in Acts chapter 5. This is the first mentioned instance of Satan. Acts 1, 2, 3, 4. Acts 5 is the first mentioned, specifically mentioned instance of an attack on the early church by by Satan. And, And what is even more interesting to me is that it's not mentioned because of sin outside the church. It came from sin inside the church. Listen, Satan has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. And sometimes he uses persecution from outside the church. But his best tactics have always been when he can attack from inside the church. Ananias and Sapphira, Adam and Eve, and today. His best tactics is when he can get the church to confuse friend with foe. His best tactic is when we begin to compete and compare with each other rather than love and prefer one another, isn't it? And listen, I'm not not negating the bad things of persecution, although it's a bit of a first world problem for us when we're like, oh, we're being persecuted as a church. Here's the reality. The church actually grows under persecution. The greatest threat to church is inside. Always. Always. Threats from outside are actually a bit healthy for us, I'm going to be honest. It's the threats of of inside that take us down. The greatest threat has always been friendly fire from inside the church. That's why God takes it so seriously. He goes on, it says this, verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Cause of death, (laughs) COVID-19. So sorry. Too soon? Is it too soon? I should have waited a year. I know. Well, I didn't have a choice. I'm sorry. That was good. I just, you got, it was so serious in here. You needed it. You needed a laugh. And I'm sorry if you're offended. Not sorry. But um, (laughs) come on. That was good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, all right, I want you to pay attention to. The, uh, I know I reeled it in, reeled it in. I want to. I want you to pay attention to the response of the church here. Um, it says this in verse five: it says, "He fell down and died." Um, and, and then, great fear. These were two words: great fear seized all who heard what had happened, to which you'd probably be like, uh, yeah, duh, yeah, of course we would. And then those same two words show up again in verse 11 after Sapphira dies. Read it, verse 11. Great fear seized the whole church who had heard about these events. Isn't that interesting? Take note, it says, great fear came upon the whole church. And what is, what is doubly interesting to me is this. It doesn't seem to be posed as a bad thing. Which is a bit confusing because I've grown up thinking and understanding that fear is, is a bad thing, right? 
it's certainly not a, a, a God thing or, or a good thing. And I can think of a dozen scriptures that would talk about like fear not, right? That we're not supposed to fear. Second Timothy 1.7 says, uh, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we talk about that. Like, you know, believers shouldn't walk in fear. And yet we also see these seemingly contradictory scriptures like Proverbs 1-7 where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Here's an interesting one in Exodus 20-20. It actually has both in here. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. It's, it's, it's like Moses is contradicting himself because in one sentence we are being both discouraged to fear and also encouraged that it's a good thing to fear. Like, what I see here is that Moses is simply showing the difference between being scared of God and having the fear of the Lord. These two things going on. What's the difference? Being scared of God will cause you to hide from God. Having the fear of the Lord will make you terrified to be away from him. Being scared of God will make you run away from God, but having the fear of the Lord will make you run to him. These two things, both fear, we, we kind of hold in tension. And I would argue that Ananias and Sapphira did not have the fear of the Lord. Why? Because the fear of the Lord will, not, will cause you to not sin. That's what it says in Exodus 20, 20, that when we have the fear of the Lord before us, it will cause us to not sin. Essentially, Ananias and Sapphira were seeking the approval of man over the approval of God. I, I, wanna, I want to get the applause of people rather than the applause from heaven. And it, quite honestly, it was their preoccupation with the approval of man that caused them to lie to God. And you may be thinking like, okay, well, Pastor Justin, I've always heard and that, that that word fear and uh, really kind of can be translated in different ways because, you know, it makes us feel uncomfortable. Like we shouldn't fear God. And so we translate it as reverence and awe and honor and respect. And so we were like, yeah, well, fear of the Lord is just having reverence for him and having honor for him and having respect for him. And that's fine and that's true. But here's the thing, church. I also think it's okay for us to just sit in the reality of that word. Fear. Not being scared of God, but having the fear of the Lord, rather than trying to explain it away, rather than trying to skirt the issue, rather than trying to evade it. Having the fear of the Lord is something that honestly I think we're missing in our day. Inside the church, inside the church, it is far too easy to live our lives as practical atheists. People who say, okay, yeah, I believe in God, but live as though he doesn't exist. Being a practical atheist. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. If you keep reading in Acts chapter 5 and, and beyond, this event this weird event that we're like, man, I'd just rather not talk about this. Can we just skip to ch chapter six? This is, this is just weird. This event ushers in a, a revival of sorts, right? There's healing, signs, and wonders. You can keep reading in Acts chapter five. Right after this happens, great fear seizes the church, and then this revival breaks out. Signs, I mean, people are healed in Peter's shadow. Like it, it, all of a sudden, just the Holy Spirit breaks out in ways that, that, that he wasn't he wasn't doing before this happens. It, a revival literally just breaks out in, in huge proportions. And what I've been praying about this week is this one question. Honestly, I've been asking the Lord this. What if, what if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of revival? What if, what if we are waiting for God to show up and to break out in a, in a tent revival meeting? still. And what if God is actually waiting for his church to break down and repent?
because I honestly think that, that the American church could use a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord. It's sobering, isn't it? This is a sobering story. But what I find is that an untested church becomes a sleepy church. An untested church always becomes a sleepy church. And if we simply live like it, it, what ends up happening to us is that when, we, when we're an unrepentant church, we become comforted by a demonic lullaby that just says, everything's just okay. It's okay. No big rush. Just sleep. It's fine. Just sleep. What if we lived a holy life not because we wanted to please men? What if we simply lived a holy life because we had a healthy fear of the Lord? I'm going to walk in the way that I'm supposed to, in the way that God is calling me to do, not because I want the applause of men or the approval of people, but I'm going to walk in it because I'm, I'm being led by the Holy Spirit and because I crave the approval of God. And we don't do it to get his approval. We do it because we, we walk in his approval. What if that's what it looks like? And this story, this awkward, weird story of Ananias and Sapphira is a sobering reminder that this is not a game that we're playing. Church, this is life and death. And we can explain it away and say, well, God just was dealing with the early church differently than he does us today. God, I just thank you that I am still here. <laughs> I thank you that your grace is keeping me and holding back in your mercy what I do deserve. That's the beauty of what it is that God is doing. And, and church, do, please, um, just because people are not falling dead in church anymore, do not think that God does not see or know your heart. That's the sobering reality of this scripture. What if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of revival? Why don't you stand with me? Now, here's the benefit. I know this is, it's a sobering text. Psalm 25, verse 14 says this in the New Living Translation, the Lord is a friend to those who fear him. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. Those who have the fear of the Lord become friends of God. That's essentially what it's saying. And I was thinking, I, I don't know why, last, last week I was, ta- I was singing that song, there's something about that name, and I'm not a singer. And so um, I, was, I was thinking about an, another old, old song of Amazing Grace. And I think it's the second verse, and it talks about the fear of the Lord in it. And we've sung it for years, and you probably could, could sing it too. It just says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." Think about those words. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. <laughs> How precious did that grace appear the hour. I first believed. It is his grace that should teach our hearts to have the fear of the Lord. And it is also his grace that relieves us having to be afraid of God. We can walk boldly into the throne room because of his grace. And we also can stand in awe and in reverence of his grace and his mercy in our life. And we should want to walk in holiness and say no to what he says no to and yes to what he says yes to because of that absolutely ridiculous grace. I wonder if the revival that we are seeking is not the revival that we will find. 
what if the revival that, what if revival looks a whole lot like the church getting a hold of the fear of the Lord? So I just want to encourage you as we sing this today, maybe there's an area of your life that you just know that God has called you to walk in and you've been resistant to it. Maybe there's an area of your life that you know God has said no to and you've just chosen to go where no one treads and you've decided, I'm not listening. I'm going and doing my own thing. I would say you don't have the fear of the Lord. And sometimes we hold back and we say things with our mouth, but our hearts aren't in it. We say, oh, yes, I've done this, or I'm going to do that, or I've been here and I've done that. And we put the facade up and we live a photoshopped Christian life, and yet our hearts aren't really there. And I've said this before, God cannot heal who you pretend to be. He can only heal who you truly are. And so Jesus, as we sing today, I pray that you would strip away all of the the photoshopped Christianity. I pray you'd you'd strip away all of the things that, that we're saying with our mouths, but we're withholding in our hearts. And I pray that you would truly be our Lord and our Savior. Holy Spirit, lead us. May our yes be yes and our no be no as we walk in obedience to you even if we don't understand it, even if it's hard, even if we don't like it, and even if I disagree. Lord, I pray that you would be honored in this place. Church, let's lift him up. I pray that that you would be led to wherever it is that God is calling you to do, to be, to act, to give, to forgive, whatever that that God is calling you to do. I pray that he would be honored in this place. Lord, let's worship him together.